Thank you. Thanks so much. All right, can everyone hear me okay? Okay, good. Um, thank you. It's an honor to be here. I'm going to be talking about something that happened in the Libertarian Party of Florida about 20 years ago. Now, uh, I mentioned this to somebody in the hall, and they said, oh, did you do a lot of research on it? And I said, no, I was there. <laughs> so I just want to see a show of hands. How many of you were active in the Libertarian Party of Florida, say, about 20 years ago? Okay. Just a couple of people. Okay, so a lot of people may not be aware of this history, and I think it's very important history. Uh, it's good for us to have an institutional memory about what we've done. And also, I think what I'm going to tell you is something that can be very useful in the future. In fact, in the very near future. Now, I just want to tell you a little background about myself. I moved to Florida from New York in 1993. And uh, I had already voted Libertarian for president the first time in 1992. And so as soon as I got to Florida, I registered to vote and I registered as a Libertarian. Now, the first big election that we had was 1994. And before the election, I did something that I, I like to do, was I got a copy of the ballot to see who was on it so I could figure out who I was going to vote for. And I figured there would probably be some Libertarian candidates on the ballot that I could vote for. And to my shock, there were only Democrats and Republicans on the ballot. And uh, so I actually called up the supervisor of elections office and said, well, there must be some mistake. There are only Democrats and Republicans on the ballot. And the person that I talked to said to me, well, that's because those are the only parties that met the qualifications to be on the ballot. And uh, I was a little disturbed by that. Uh, I soon came to find out that Florida had not just the toughest ballot access laws in the country, it had the toughest ballot access laws in the free world. <laughs> now, this was uh, several years after the fall of the Iron Curtain. And of course, they had liberalized the voting requirements in Russia. And so actually, I talked to Richard Winger, the ballot access expert, about this. And he said, actually, you need a smaller percentage of voters, signatures from a smaller percentage of voters to get on the ballot in Russia than you need to get on the ballot in Florida if you're a minor party. Uh, eventually, we developed a slogan, kind of a mantra. And we would tell people, it's easier to get on the ballot in St. Petersburg, Russia, than it is in St. Petersburg, Florida. <laughs> so. Um, also in uh, 1995, or 94, December 94, um, I got a message from the, my local LP, the Broward Libertarian Party. I was living in Broward at the time. And uh, it said that they were having their December meeting and they were going to elect officers for the next year. And it was at somebody's house, and so I showed up at his house, and there were about five people that showed up. And so naturally, I got elected as an officer. Uh, <laughs> and, the, and I became the secretary of the Libertarian Party of Broward County. And that started my career as a political activist. And for a couple of years, I uh, published a newsletter, uh, which the, all the guys on the executive committee uh, would uh, chip in money for it. So it was the Broward County Libertarian Party newsletter. And that led to my being the editor of Florida Liberty, the state party newsletter. And I held that position from 1995 to 2000. And we uh, put out six newsletters a year. And uh, I got out six newsletters every year and got them out on time. It was a printed newsletter, of course, at that time. I also became the LPF secretary uh, from 1996 to 98. And I was the LPF vice chair from 98 to 99. Now, I want to just tell you a little bit about what the ballot access laws were like at that time. Now, as you, as you know, probably, most of you, uh, in order to be considered a major party in Florida, you have to have 5% of the registered voters registered to your party. Now, in uh, 1994, uh, there were 6.5 million registered voters in Florida. So 5% of that would be 325,000. 
So we had 5,000 registered voters. So we were 320,000 registered voters short. Obviously not a major party yet. Uh, we also had about 1,500 dues-paying members in the state party at that time. I don't know what the numbers are now. And the rules for president and for state elections were different. It was actually easier to get a candidate on the ballot for president than it was to get somebody on the ballot for, say, a statewide office like governor or U.S. senator or uh, even for a state house or state senate. And here's the way it worked. Uh, to get a candidate on the ballot for president, we had to get signatures from 1% of the registered voters. That means we had to get 65,000 signatures in 1996 to get Harry Brown on the ballot. And we did that with a lot of help from the National Party, which was very much committed to presidential candidates being on the ballot in all 50 states. So they poured some money into it, but they had to pour more money into Florida than any place else. It was one of the three or four toughest states to get somebody on the ballot. Actually, it was the toughest. Um, so the, the rules were different uh, if it was a state election. And instead of having to get 1%, you had to get 3%. So that meant uh, if it was a statewide office, you'd have to get 3% of the registered voters. So that's uh, close to 200,000 signatures. Uh, and that would have been uh, the number in uh, 1996. And then for uh, a local election, a state house election or something like that, it's 3% of the registered voters in that district that you're running in. That's the rule for libertarians and for other minor parties. Now, the rule for the Democrats or Republicans was very simple. You had a choice. You could just pay the filing fee, and you're on the ballot. Or if you wanted to petition, you wanted to just do petition signatures if you're a Democrat or Republican, then if you were a Democrat, you had to get 3% of the registered Democrats in your district. And if you were a Republican, you had to get 3% of the registered Republicans in your district. So there was a choice for them. For us, it was first you have to collect all these signatures. And it's not just 3% of the people in your party. It's 3% of all registered voters. So even the petition requirement was much tougher for libertarians and other minor parties than it was for the Democrats and Republicans. So here we had basically one set of rules for the major parties and another set of rules uh, for all the other parties. Now, there's always an upside to everything, I think. And the only upside that I could find to these ballot access laws in Florida was that if you went to a Libertarian Party national convention and you were talking to people from other states and you heard somebody whining about what a tough time they had getting on the ballot in their state. Um, and I remember people from Virginia saying, oh, if we want to run a candidate for governor, we have to get 15,000 signatures. Well, by this time, by this time, we had to get 250,000. So I would just say, you wimps, 15,000, that's it? We have to get 250,000. And their jaws would drop, and they would go away utterly defeated. <laughs> <laughs> so what was, what was the justification for keeping these ballot access laws. Well, actually, these laws had existed since about the 1930s. And we suspect that they were probably put there to keep the communists off the ballot. And one of the justifications for it was we don't want an overcrowded ballot. We don't want the voters to be confused by having too many choices on the ballot. Of course, the voters who walk into a grocery store and have thousands of choices to make about what they're going to buy, but they can't figure out if you've got three or four or five candidates on the ballot. They're not going to be able to figure that out, right? And as it turned out, the ballots in Florida were not overcrowded. They were undercrowded. And let me give you an example. Now, 1998, which was the last year that uh, these primitive ballot access laws existed, in the general election, out of the 23 US Congress races, 17 were uncontested. 
And uh, yes, the Democrats and Republicans didn't even run against each other. I guess it was professional courtesy. Uh, so in the uh, state House races, there were uh, state Senate races, there were 20 state Senate races, 14 were uncontested. And out of the 120 state House races, 70 were uncontested. So those are really undercrowded ballots as far as I'm concerned. Now there was another little wrinkle in the law that had to do with major parties and minor parties. And that was that if you were a major party and uh, a candidate uh, paid his filing fee, then uh, a rebate would go back to the party. And the party could do whatever it wanted to do with that. And uh, if you were a minor party, you didn't get the rebate. Your candidate paid the filing fee, and, and that was it. You didn't get any of it back. So of course, the Libertarian Party filed a lawsuit on this. And uh, this went all the way to the Florida Supreme Court in a case called Libertarian Party versus Smith, 1996. And uh, Smith, of course, was the Secretary of State at the time, who was the proper person to be named in the suit. And the Florida Supreme Court upheld that system, whereby the filing fees were handled in a discriminatory way. And I want to read you a little bit of the language from their opinion, because I think it's very telling. The Florida Supreme Court decided that this system for rebates on filing fees was reasonably related to the state's important interest in strengthening and encouraging major parties, <laughs> and thereby discouraging minor parties as a means of preventing factionalism and the multiplicity of splinter groups. It gets better. <laughs> the, legislator, le the legislature has set up a threshold requirement that only parties with the support of 5% or more of the registered voters may receive such rebates. This threshold requirement, of course, fosters only the participation in the political arena of stable, established parties. We cannot disagree that the state has an interest in doing this. I, I think what's interesting about this is that they're so blunt about it. They're actually telling you what they're doing, which a lot of times they'll try to find a more sugar-coated reasoning for what they're doing. But this, they told us exactly how they felt about us uh, in this opinion. So what were we, were we going to do about this? Well, uh, a big hero arose in the party at that time. And that was Dan Walker, who was an attorney who lived in Tallahassee, and he was on the LPF Executive Committee. And he was the attorney who had argued Libertarian Party versus Smith in the Florida Supreme Court. And Dan pointed out to us that there was a provision in the Florida Constitution called the Constitution Revision Commission. And this is a commission, it's sort of like one of those fairy stories. It just appears once every 20 years, and then it disappears. Uh, actually, every 20 years under the Constitution, there is a Constitution Revision Commission appointed. It has 37 members. Several of them are appointed by the governor, some by the Speaker of the Florida House, President of the Florida Senate, and Chief Justice of the Florida Supreme Court. And uh, the Attorney General of the state is an ex officio member of the Constitution Revision Commission. Now, what does this commission do? Well, it holds hearings around the state, public hearings that people can go to, people like us who are not elected officials, don't have any position in government, and can just go there and get up in front of a microphone and tell the Constitution Revision Commission what you think should be changed in the Florida Constitution. And the commission will listen to suggestions. Eventually, it will draft its own proposals based on what it's heard uh, for changes to the Constitution. Those go on the ballot, and the voters get final approval of them. So that is part of the legal process in Florida for changing the Constitution. Now, this happened back in 1997 and 98. It's a two-year process. So in 1997, they started holding the hearings. Uh, eventually, the 
commission decided which things they wanted to put on the ballot for the voters to approve. And that actually occurred in November 1998 when the voters got to approve or disapprove the revisions to the Constitution that the commission had suggested. So Dan pointed out that we, we needed to get involved in this because uh, this was one possible way to change the ballot access laws and maybe even to get some other changes in the Constitution that might make this a more libertarian state. So um, I, at the time, as I mentioned, was the newsletter editor and uh, the secretary of the party at the time. And so I got what Dan was saying, and I started putting in the newsletter articles about this process that was coming up, the Constitution Revision Commission process. And they listed the dates when all the hearings were going to be. They were in about 12 major cities around the state. And I encouraged people to go to the Constitution Revision Commission hearings. All you had to do was sign up, and you could get five minutes where you could talk to the commission. Now, this process was greatly aided by a fantastic new invention at the time, which was called email. And I remember that when I first became secretary of the party, which was uh, about 1996, uh, when I had to send out the minutes of the last meeting or the announcement of the next meeting, I had to print it up on my printer, put it in envelopes, stamp it, drop it in a mailbox. It, it's hard to believe that you actually had to go through all that, but I actually did it all. But by the time, by the end of my tenure as secretary, everybody had email. And I could just send them an email. Uh, and I didn't have to go through all of that. And not only that, but I had started to make a list of libertarian activists with their email addresses. And uh, I had started at one state convention. I just passed a sheet around and asked people to put their name and email address on it. And I started with that. And by the time this was happening, I had maybe 150, 200 email addresses on my list. And that was a lot. And those 150 or 200 people ended up accomplishing quite a bit. Now, um, the first hearing that was held in my area was in Fort Lauderdale. As I said, I lived in Broward County then. And I got there early in the morning. I was one of the first people to sign up. Now, when you signed up, they gave you a little yellow card. You put your name and address on it, and they would mark on it the time that you signed up. And then the card would be given to Dexter Douglas, who was the chair of the Constitution Revision Committee, Commission. And uh, he had been appointed by Governor Childs to be the chairman. He was also counsel to Governor Childs. And a uh, nice southern gentleman type. And he's up there kind of flipping through his cards. And he's, he'll say, oh, the next speaker is so and so. And then that person would, would get to go, go up and speak. Now, as I said, I signed up really early. And I didn't get to speak until late in the afternoon, which I thought was really odd. but. That's, that's what happened. I gave my speech. I talked mostly about ballot access. Uh, don't remember a lot of the details of what I said. But uh, interestingly enough, that evening, uh, Nick Dunbar, who was the chair of the LPF at that time, uh, had a dinner for the people in Broward County who had spoken at the hearing. And he had a couple of special guests. And one of them was uh, somebody who's an icon in the libertarian movement, Robert Poole, who was the founder of Reason Magazine and the Reason Foundation. And the other person was Stanley Marshall, who was at that time the president of the James Madison Institute, a libertarian think tank in Tallahassee. And not only that, Stanley Marshall was a member of the Constitution Revision Commission. Uh, so somehow, we got one libertarian on the commission. <laughs> Thank God. Stanley Marshall told me that he had protested to Dexter Douglas about the way he was handling the speakers. Because Dexter Douglas had told to the members of the commission that he had decided that the people who signed up earliest would be the last to speak. And he explained why. Because those people, in Dexter Douglas's words, were the off-the-wall people. <laughs> and he wanted to make sure that they didn't get to speak until late in the day when most of the press would, left, had, would have left, and those people would not get any press coverage. 
that was his raison d'etre about how he uh, would operate the uh, handling of speakers at the commission hearings. Well, you might imagine how I felt about that. <laughs> I'm going to spare you the language that I used at the time, uh, but I, I will say I was hopping mad. I mean, I was furious. And I looked at the schedule of Constitutional Revision Commission hearings that were still to come. There were still quite a few, and I noticed that in a few weeks there was going to be one in Orlando. And I decided I would take the day off from work, and I would drive up to Orlando, and I would give Dexter Douglas a piece of my mind. <laughs> and I wrote a speech, and it really just poured out of me. I made very few revisions afterwards. Um, and then I uh, got up to Orlando the morning of the hearing, and I met uh, a lot of the other libertarians who were going to be speaking. By the way, at the hearings, Fortunately, we usually had at least two libertarians at each hearing, sometimes eight or nine. And I think there were about 10 libertarians ready to speak at the Orlando hearing from Orange County and Seminole County, which both had very strong uh, affiliates at that time. And uh, in Seminole County, I don't know how it is today, but at that time, they had gotten a lot of libertarians elected or appointed to nonpartisan boards, county boards. And one of them who was there was Carl Williamson, who was on the Seminole County Historical Commission. So, as I said, there were about 10 or 12 uh, libertarians there ready to give their speeches, myself included. The only one who got to speak before lunch was Carl Williamson, and I think that's because he was a county official. And that's pretty much the way it worked. The politicians who wanted to speak, they would just come up, say what they had to say, and they'd leave. And the rest of us ordinary folk had to just sit around and wait for the mercy of Dexter Douglas to allow us to go up and, and give our talk. So, um, as I said, nobody else had a chance to talk. No other libertarians talked before lunch except Carl Williamson. So we took a break for lunch. We all come back. And then early on, after we had started, started up again in the afternoon session, Dexter Douglas was flipping his little cards around, deciding who was going to be next. And I guess he must have made a mistake because he said that Carl Williamson would be the next speaker. Carl had already spoken in the morning. So I got together with the other libertarians who were there, and I said, OK, since I'd been to one of these hearings before, I knew what to do. I said, OK, this is our chance. What we need to do is one of us needs to go up there. And now, of course, we're not going to pretend we're Carl, Carl Williamson, but we're going to go up there and say, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Williamson had to leave, but he asked if I could take his place. And this way, one of us will get to give her speech before the day is over. And everybody thought that was a great idea. And they thought, I should be the one to do it. <laughs> and I thought, OK, well, there's a line from Shakespeare about screwing your courage to the sticking point. Uh, so I had to do that. I went up to the lectern. Uh, Dexter Douglas turns to me, says, Mr. Williamson? I said, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Williamson had to leave early, but he asked if I could take his place. And so Dexter Douglas asked me what my name was. I said, Tom Renier. He goes through his little cards. He, says, he finds my cards. He says, oh, OK, sure. Smiles at me and uh, lets me go ahead and give my speech. <laughs> A few minutes later, he was not smiling. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read to you parts of my speech. Now, remember, it's a five-minute speech. I'm not going to read every bit of it, but parts of it. I'm going to explain what happened as I was giving this speech, because it did not go uninterrupted. So I said, members of the commission, my name is Tom Renier, and I spoke to the Con Constitution Revision Commission once before in Fort Lauderdale. After I heard some of the views expressed to the commission, I felt the need to come back and speak again. I was concerned by the sentiment expressed by one of the speakers in Fort Lauderdale that while the people have certain rights, it is the government that has the power. This is a misleading statement. In this country, the people are sovereign. The government has only those powers delegated to it by the people. This was a new concept about government when it was expressed in the Declaration of Independence. Before that, kings ruled their subjects. The king was the master, 
and the people had to do what he said. The Declaration made it clear that men formed governments for the sole purpose of protecting their rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Governments are there to protect those rights, not to control the people, not to rule the people, not to direct their lives for them, but to guard their liberties. I hope you will keep this in mind when considering changes to the state constitution. Another sentiment I heard expressed at the Fort Lauderdale hearing was one with which I strongly agree, and that is Lord Acton's famous saying, power corrupts. I know that many of you, outside of your roles as commissioners, are used to wielding power. When you're in that position, it becomes very easy to believe that one has a special knowledge or wisdom that others don't have. And the exercise of power can be seductive and addictive. It can lead even the best intentioned persons into a state of arrogant disregard for the wisdom and good sense of those in less powerful positions. I am here to warn you against the arrogance of power. When I hear rumblings that the citizens' initiative process is too easy and needs to be made more burdensome so that the voters have an even harder time changing the law, I am concerned about the arrogance of power. When Florida passes asset forfeiture laws that allow a person's property to be seized on the mere suspicion of a crime, in complete disregard of the due process of law, and when these laws compel those suspects, 80% of whom are never even charged with a crime, let alone convicted, to prove their innocence in order to retrieve their property, then I am concerned about the arrogance of power. Has no one in state government spoken up to condemn these outrageous, unconstitutional laws? Have you forgotten why you're there? When the two parties in power create discriminatory laws to keep other parties off the ballot and justify them by saying the voters would be confused by too many choices, I am concerned about the arrogance of power. Stop treating the voters like children who can't make decisions. And stop pretending that laws that are passed to protect someone's political turf and to stifle competition are somehow a service to the voters. When the will of the people strongly favors an amendment to limit the taxing power of the state, and yet the Florida Supreme Court strikes it down on the basis that the voters didn't know what they were voting for, this is the arrogance of power. In a land where the people are supposed to rule, who can argue with allowing the voters to approve any new taxes? What makes the Supreme Court think it knows better than the people? When the legislature passes a law that major parties will get a rebate on candidate filing fees while minor parties get none, and the state Supreme Court upholds this law on the basis that the state has an interest in protecting major parties, I see the arrogance of power. Yes, the state has an interest in protecting major parties, just as kings have an interest in protecting monarchies. What happened to a government for the people, a government that was supposed to be there to protect the little guy? Since when is it supposed to protect the people in power? And when this commission makes a decision for reasons unknown, that people who arrive earliest at these hearings will have to speak last, then I smell the arrogance of power. <laughs> now, I'd gotten some applause along the way, but that got the most applause <laughs> I'd gotten up to that point. Um, I went on with my speech. I said, I hope that when you consider changes to the Constitution, you will remember George Washington's words that government is not reason, it is not eloquence, it is force, and realize that every time you pass a law, it must be backed up by the force of government guns. 
And any time you think of using government to bestow blessings on any of your constituencies, I hope you will remember that government cannot give material things to anyone without first taking them away from someone else. Now, I still had about a paragraph to go in my speech. But I got interrupted by Dexter Douglas, the chairman. And he said, you've gone over your time. You're using somebody else's time. That's the arrogance of power. <laughs> well, boy, I was flabbergasted. He's, he's calling the arrogance of power on me. I'm not the one with the power. He's the one with the gavel. He's the one with the little yellow cards. He's the one that had all the power. But before I could say a word, a woman in the audience, somebody that I'd never met before, stood up and said, well, he's saying what I would have said. He can have my time. And the audience cheered, and I just took that as leave to continue, and I went on with my speech. I said, I hope state government will not make the mistake that the federal government has made of trying to solve every problem and to poke its nose into every aspect of life. Since government relies on coercion to achieve its aims, it is too blunt an instrument for solving most social problems. Adam Smith, the economist, said that it is impossible for planners to manipulate members of society the way they would arrange pieces on a chessboard because human beings, unlike chess pieces, have a will of their own. Members of the commission, it is the arrogance of power that treats people as pawns on a chessboard and not as intelligent, self-determined beings. Thank you. Thank you. So I sat down, and um, I stayed and listened to all the rest of the hearing. And uh, the members of the LP from uh, Seminole and Orange Counties got up eventually towards the end of the day. They finally got to give their speeches. And they were beautiful. They were eloquent. They talked about ballot access, and they talked about what other, whatever libertarian issues were dearest to their hearts. And, and it was just a, a pleasure to be there. And as I was sitting there, Three of the commissioners sought me out and talked to me. And the first one was Stanley Marshall, who, I, as I mentioned, was uh, president of the James Madison Institute. And he said he loved my speech. He asked if they could print it in their journal. And I said, sure. And actually, it did get printed a few months later. I have copies up here if anybody wants to grab one later on. And. Um, also, I was approached by Kenneth Connor, another member of the commission. And he said that the ballot access laws, as they existed in Florida, were, in his word, indefensible. And Carlos Alfonso also found me. And he said that he thought that they had to do something about the ballot access laws. Now, as I said, I had this email list. I sent the email out to my list of activists. I told them about that hearing, I told them, I gave them the text of my speech. Um, and I talked about this policy that the Constitution Revision Commission had of making the first people to sign up be the last to speak. And somebody on that list forwarded this to a reporter at the St. Petersburg Times. And pretty soon, there was an article in the St. Petersburg Times explaining about Dexter Douglas's and the first shall be last policy. The Constitution Revision Commission voted to change its policy. And the policy from then on would be first come, first served. You would speak in the order in which you signed up. So that was a nice little victory there. And uh, there was another round of hearings later on. There was another one in Fort Lauderdale. I went there. And I made sure I was the first person to sign up. And I was also the first person to speak. Uh, and one of the things I said there was, I said, well, suppose that we had a law that for a man to run for governor, all he would have to do is pay the filing fee. But for a woman to run for governor, she would have to collect 250,000 signatures. Or suppose we said a white person can run for governor by paying, paying the filing fee 
but a black person has to collect 250,000 signatures. Well, anybody can see right away that that's discriminatory. But we don't discriminate based on gender or race. We discriminate based on political beliefs. In a country that was founded on the idea that everybody was entitled to their own political beliefs. Now, there was still a lot of work to do to make sure that uh, the Constitution Revision Commission put a provision on the ballot that would change the ballot access laws. And one of the things we did is we started a coalition with several other minor parties. Now, Brian Collar, by this time, had become the chair of the LPF. Nick Dunbar had left to work in the national headquarters. And I had moved up from secretary to vice chair. And so Brian and I got together with uh, members of the Green Party, the Reform Party, the Natural Law Party, and yes, even the Socialist Party. And uh, I want to make a point about this. You know, as libertarians, of course, we want to elect libertarian candidates, but we can also change things by working on specific issues, the way we worked on this ballot access issue. And when you do that, you team up with other people who agree with you on that issue, even though they may not agree with you on anything else. You can always work together on that one issue that you agree on. And that is one of the ways that libertarians can make political change, and that's what we did. And so we got the other people in these other parties uh, sending letters, sending faxes to the members of the commission. Now, as I said, there were 37 commissioners. We had a list of their names. We knew their home addresses, we knew their home phone numbers, we knew their home fax numbers. They would get faxes in their homes about ballot access. And we knew that on a particular day, the commission was going to get together and they were going to vote on a ballot access provision. Vote on whether to keep it in or leave it out. And uh, by the way, I talked to one of the members of the Socialist Party the day uh, that day, and he said that the night before, they had been up all night sending faxes to the commissioners. So all the parties were getting involved in it. And we knew that the day that they were going to vote on this ballot access provision, there were only going to be 28 of the 37 commissioners present. Now let me explain one of the rules. To get anything approved, you needed a three-fifths majority on the commission. So that's, uh, that's 23 votes. And you had to get 23 votes no matter how many commissioners were present. It's not three-fifths of just the ones that are present. It's three-fifths of all commissioners. So that meant if there were only going to be 28 commissioners there that day, uh, if six of them voted against ballot access and 22 voted for it, it would fail. So we knew it could be a very close call. So, of course, I was on pins and needles the whole day, and I knew when I got home and checked my email, of course, in those days, it was hard to check your email on the, on the web. You couldn't do that, really. So uh, I had to go home and check my email, and I knew there would be an email there from Dan Walker, who would be attending the hearing in Tallahassee, and he would tell us exactly what happened. So Dan said that one of the commissioners said that they had no idea how bad the ballot access laws were. They said that they had gotten an education and a civics lesson from the hearings. One of them said that you would have thought that the two main parties in Florida were the Libertarians and the Greens, not the Democrats and the Republicans. And they voted on whether to approve a ballot access provision. They voted unanimously to approve it, 28 to nothing. This was one of the few provisions in the whole process that got a unanimous approval from the whole commission. Well, great. So when we started out, we weren't sure if we were going to get anywhere with this. And we actually kind of surprised ourselves by getting this far. And I think a lot of us in the Libertarian Party at the time, once we found out this was going to be on the ballot, we kind of looked at each other and went, wow, now what do we do? <laughs> <laughs>
because we've been able to reach these 37 commissioners. I mean, there were just 37 of them, right? That's not too hard. Now we were going to have to reach 8 million voters, which is how many registered voters there were in the state at this time. And uh, at a national convention, we asked some other people how much, um, uh, what they would do uh, for a ballot access provision or any kind of ballot issue, how much it would cost to uh, get that done. And they said, well, you probably have to spend three or four hundred thousand dollars on TV advertising. Well, um, as you can imagine, we did not have three or four hundred thousand dollars at the time. Um, now, there was a person on the executive committee who had had some experience professionally managing campaigns. He had managed some campaigns for some Republicans, and then he'd become more libertarian. He started managing some libertarian campaigns. And I said to him that I thought he would be a great campaign manager for the, what we called the Revision 11 campaign, because that was the number that this provision was going to be on the ballot. There were several provisions that the Constitution Revision Commission had approved, and ours was number 11, called Revision 11. So I asked him if he would want to manage the campaign since he had professional experience. And he said that he was afraid that Revision 11 was going to lose and that everybody in the party would be mad at him, and so he declined to manage the campaign. So, okay, I went to Gary Alardi, who was the chair of the Electoral Victory Committee at that time, and I said to him, well, Gary, maybe you can talk this guy into managing the campaign. Gary kind of paused for a moment. He turned to me, he pointed to me, and he said, Tom, you're the campaign manager. And I realized that he was right, that I was, and that I actually had been for a while. Um, so, okay, and I wasn't worried about people being mad at me if it lost. I knew we had to do the best we could to get this done. So I came up with a strategy. It was a two-part strategy. And the first part is something that I don't know if it would work as well today because things have changed a lot. But the first part of the strategy was that we would write letters to the editors of newspapers. Now, this was in the days when newspapers were printed. And you'd open them up. You remember those? <laughs> and, uh, you know, you get newsprint on your hands and stuff like that. Uh, well, everything's online now. But in those days, it was a truism that the most widely read part of the daily newspaper was the letters to the editor. That's where you could find out what other citizens were thinking. And not only that, but we realized that this would be sending a message to the editorial boards of the newsletters themselves that people cared about Revision 11. So I had my email list. I said to everybody, start writing letters to your local newspapers. And also I found out that all of the daily newspapers in Florida, I think there were about 19 at the time, all of them would accept letters from anybody anywhere in the state. So I encouraged them not just to write to your local newspaper, write to other newspapers. I myself had about 10 letters that I sent to newspapers all over the state that got published. So people, people started writing these letters. I gave them some facts they could use, some talking points, but they wrote their own letters and they were beautiful. They were very eloquent. Uh, they started getting published in newspapers all over the state, and people would send me copies of the letters that they got published, and I would uh, copy some of those in my email newsletter that I was sending out, and I would put some of them in the printed newsletter, quotations from them, to show everybody what we were doing and how we were reaching the public about Revision 11. Now, it got to one point where I noticed that we hadn't seen any letters in the Tampa Tribune about Revision 11. And so I wrote to some of the activists in the Tampa area. I said, has there been anything in the Tampa Tribune? And they said, no. And it, by the way, this is not just libertarians on the list anymore. It's Reform Party people, socialists, uh, Green Party, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so uh, they said, no, there hasn't been anything in the Tampa Tribune. So that week, I said to my email list, OK, this week, everybody write a letter to the Tampa Tribune. Well, within a week, there were about five letters about Revision 11 and ballot access in the Tampa Tribune. So I think this gave us a huge leg up in the process because 
by the time the election came around, all of the daily newspapers in the state, except for two of them, had endorsed Revision 11. And uh, even the two that didn't endorse it had individual editorial writers in the paper who encouraged people to vote for re Revision 11. So every single daily paper in the state had something in it encouraging people to vote for Revision 11. And a lot of the newspapers would print on the day of the election or just before, they'd have a list of recommendations for how you should vote in the election. A lot of people would cut those out and carry them with them into the voting booth. And uh, so having most of the newspapers endorsing Revision 11, I'm sure, helped a great deal. So that was the first part of my strategy. And the second part was we got radio ads on the Rush Limbaugh show the last three days leading up to the election. And we found out we could do this for a reasonable amount of money. And uh, we picked the Rush Limbaugh show because people who listen to the Rush Limbaugh show vote. So um, we did raise a bit of money. I wrote a fundraising letter. Now, I'd written a few fundraising letters for the LPF that had raised uh, several thousand dollars. And I'd learned how to write a fundraising letter from Perry Willis, who had been at the national headquarters at that time. And so on this one, I knew that my first sentence was going to be, this may very well be the last letter we will ever have to send you about ballot access. Because of course, anybody who had been involved with the party knew that ballot access was our big barrier. We couldn't do anything really. Uh, until we got ballot access. And I said, th this chance is not going to come along again very often. We've got to make it go right this time. And uh, so we sent that out to our 1,500 dues paying members, and they sent us back $15,000, which was more than enough to pay for the radio ads. It also paid for some bumper stickers and some yard signs and things like that. And so um, I wrote, two commercials, a 30-second commercial and a 60-second commercial. Uh, and I got, them, I got them produced by a professional company for not too much money. And uh, got the tapes and sent them out to all the radio stations so that they would play them the last three days before the election. Now, all the libertarians in the state knew to lis listen to the Rush Limbaugh show those last three days before the election. And everybody was just listening to it, waiting to hear our ads. And a lot of people told me that when they heard the ad, and then the announcer says at the end of it, political advertisement paid for by the Libertarian Party of Florida, that it was, they, they were high from it. They got a rush from it, no, no pun intended. But, uh, but anyway, it was a great feeling. And uh, then in November 1998, we had the election, and Revision 11 was approved with slightly under 65% of the votes. So it would have passed even under the, the current rules that we have now, where you have to get 60% to change the Constitution. I got an email from David Berglund, who was then the chair of the National LP. And by the way, if you don't remember, David Berglund was our presidential candidate in 1984. And as he liked to point out, he carried only one state less than the Democratic candidate did, <laughs> which was Walter Mondale, who carried only his home state of Minnesota. <laughs> but anyway, uh, David Berglund sent me an email, and he said that this was, in his words, the libertarian success story of the decade. And so when I put together the next issue of Florida Liberty, uh, that was the banner headline, LP success story of the decade. So we accomplished quite a lot there. Now I want to just say a little bit about the aftermath of this. This change in the election laws actually had enormous consequences in a very short time. Because this was 1998 that we did this. As you may recall, in 2000, the presidential election turned on the vote in Florida where George W. Bush beat Al Gore by a little over 500 votes. Now, what was different about the 96 election and the 2000 election? Well, 96 election, Harry Brown, the Libertarian, was the only minor party ca candidate on the ballot. 
In 2000, we had Harry Brown again on the ballot. We also had Ralph Nader on the Green Party, Pat Buchanan from the Reform Party, and a few other minor parties on the ballot. They would not have been there if it hadn't been for what the Libertarian Party did. And most significant, I think, was Ralph Nader, who got close to 95,000 votes, which was more than twice as much as all the other minor party candidates put together. And I think it's pretty safe to say that, that Ralph Nader took more votes away from Al Gore than he took away from George W. Bush, probably far more than he needed to make that 500 vote difference that we had in the election. So ironically, one of the results of this was that George W. Bush got elected president. Now, of course, as a libertarian, George W. Bush, Al Gore, Tweedledum, Tweedledee, really, you know, uh, don't, really, don't really care for either of them too much. Um, but I'll tell you, it, it did make a change in my life because after I'd gone through this whole process, I decided that I wanted to go to law school. And so I actually uh, started law school in the year 2000. And uh, some years later, I was applying for a clerkship with a federal judge in Chicago. Now, I don't know if you know too much about judicial clerkships, but they're very hard jobs to get. There's a lot of competition for them. Um, they're usually one-year terms. The, the year that I uh, uh, was applying for this clerkship, uh, the judge was looking for two clerks for the coming year, and there were 1,200 applicants for the two positions. And somehow, I got to the final, I was one of the final eight who got interviewed by the judge. And I had on my resume that I'd worked for the Libertarian Party, and I told the different posts I'd held, and I said that I managed a campaign uh, to change the ballot access laws in Florida. Now, this judge happens to have a house in Florida. He remembered the Florida election very clearly, and he started putting two, to, two and two together really fast. And he said, well, if you did anything to keep Al Gore from being president, my hat's off to you. <laughs> and so, um, needless to say, I got the job. Um, and another reason that it's important that I bring this up is, as I said, this process happens once every 20 years. So it's going to start up again next year, 2017. The process will start. There will be hearings all over the state. Libertarians should not let this go by. You should be aware of when these hearings are, when they're going to be in your town, and go there and talk about libertarian issues. And I suggest that people in the Libertarian Party of Florida might want to put their heads together and go through the Florida Constitution and look at things that you don't like, things that you would want to change, things that you think need to be put into the Constitution. And start making a wish list and forming coalitions with other groups and start planning to go to these hearings and talk to the commissioners about liberty, about making this a more libertarian state, and talking about specific issues and specific changes that you would like to see made to the Florida Constitution. Now, when you look back on this, you've got to realize that there were really about 150 to 200 people who were activists who were working on this. And they made a big change in a state with 8 million registered voters. So a small, committed group can make a difference. And we've done this before, and we can do it again. Thank you. <laughs>